few months ago, William Schneider Jr. arrived at the Caps Media Center with an absolute treasure trove of Ventura history. Bill's father, William Schneider Sr., was a highly respected teacher throughout Ventura. For years, his hobby was recording on camera interviews and family histories with fascinating people all over the county. Recently, his son, Bill Jr., gathered together more than 100 tapes from his father's archives and working here at the Caps Media Center has painstakingly restored these treasures. Bill's new series, called My Father's Stories, explores some of the very early days of Ventura County. Most of the videos were recorded 20 to 30 years ago. The people, places, and stories Bill shares are part of Ventura's rich history. Welcome to My Father's Stories. Bill, you've got so many stories, you just keep going. Who have we got today? Today we're going to talk about George Biggers and Harry Banks. Uh, George Biggers' family came to Santa Paula in 1912 and opened a small market in, in the Santa Paula Canyon. They also had a small ranch in the same area. When George was only in the eighth grade, he was looking at a small collection of bees in school, and a bee stung him right on the upper lip, and his whole face swole to astounding proportions. But that didn't deter George, and he became very interested in bee and beekeeping. And his teacher at the time gave George a lot of study material on bees and beekeeping. At the height of George's beekeeping business, he had over 5,300 active hives in the area. Whoa. And obviously bees are really critical to the whole agricultural system. The colony collapse, that's correct. Ah, well, let's see George's story. Okay. <laughs> past two million, two hundred years, a few million folks have moved to California. The large portion of the plant population here has been transplanted to our Golden State. And with all those folks and plants have come a good many insects. And just like some folks and some plants, there are some good ex insects, some that are most beneficial to mankind. And Tonight we have with us two guests to tell us about the history and the habits of honeybees. And I'd like first to introduce George Biggers from Ojai. George, how are you? We're glad to have you with us. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce also Harry Banks. Harry, good to I see you. Both. Harry, you've been a kid counselor and a teacher for a good many years, and you've made your living helping people. And you've had a hobby, though, of keeping bees. That's right. And I know you've been working as a docent down at the county museum, and you've made a little study on bees. Could you tell us something about, say, the first beekeeper in the county or something like that? Yeah, actually, Bill, Ventura County has a long and interesting history of bees and beekeeping, going back at least 130 years. One of the first men who kept bees in, in California was a man in Santa Paula by C.J. His name was C.J. Corey. And way back in 1849, the story goes that he, in introducing bees to California and to Santa Paula, uh, brought them over the mountains before the roads were even open in the dead of winter and on snowshoes. He, uh, so ca he carried hives of bees. That's right, single hives as he was coming into the county. Since that time, there have been more than a few prominent beekeepers in our county, but I want to talk about just maybe three or four of them. One, a man by the name of Easley, who lived in Moore Park, Samuel Miller Woodson Easley, if you would. <laughs> Uh, in 1883, in addition to being a beekeeper, he held several uh, re report important responsibilities throughout the county as county assessor and assistant under, sec under sheriff and so forth. But he was a beekeeper. He was a politician. Too. He was a politician, too. Uh, the record shows that he uh, sold 60 ton of honey, had it wagoned clear down to Wainimi when the, uh, when the new wharf was opened up. 
that's 120,000 pounds. Uh, and uh, he got five cents a pound for them in those days. Another man that lived in the Sami area is W. T. Richardson. In 1889, he had uh, 1,200 colonies and was pro had probably one of the finest uh, aperies in, in uh, Southern California, was a real fine beekeeper. Then there are two others, uh, uh, Robert Wilkin and uh, his son-in-law, J. F. McIntyre, lived in the Fillmore and Ventura area. And in, in addition to being interested in bees, they also were interested in the state association uh, in the uh, uh, California S State Beekeeper Association, serving in officers at least during 1901 and 1902. During these years, which we're talking about really 50 years of time from about 1850 to 1900, uh, there were years when, when there was almost no production of honey, up to the high of 3 million pounds produced in a year's time. And that, that would, that, they were figuring that there was about an average of uh, 875,000 pounds of honey, which came to almost 70 pounds a hive for honey production. So actually we have a rather interesting history in, in the past, and I haven't anywhere near finished the research I'd like to do, but uh, it's been fun. Harry, what did a hive sell for, say, 130 years ago? Yeah, almost, well, there could have been anywhere from 100 to $150 one hive in those days because, of course, they were pretty valuable. They were valuable. Well, let's ask George Biggers. Yeah. How much is the hive worth today, George? Well, a uh, uh, two-box hive is right at $60. Well, that's one thing, then, that the price is not inflated, right? You're... Well, I, I haven't taken time to decide <laughs> was inflated or not. George, when did your family first come to Ventura? Well, it was uh, 1912. 1912, and they settled in, in uh, what time? Santa Paula. Santa Paula. My father had a bake shop there, bakery. Mm -hmm. and we got interested in bees. Uh, in, uh, I heard my father talking to my mother saying when he bought her, some land he's going to develop into ranch says we've got two hives of bees and my first introduction I was about uh, well I was about six years old that uh, I didn't say anything but I run up there several blocks away and pried the cover open and got stung on the lip and it curled completely up to my nose and neighbors who had never seen well, me the next day thought I was born that way and was <laughs> feeling sorry for me. Had an affliction. <laughs> that was my first introduction to bees. First contact. Yes. How many, now from that first bee sting, George, how many hives more or less do you have today? Oh, I've cut down recently. I have had as high as 5,300, but have cut down because uh, I don't realize I'm getting older, but they say I am. <laughs> You had an interesting childhood. You spoke of a big, of quite a calamity in your family. You had a ranch, I think, up Santa Paula Canyon. Yes, and the see the great uh, freeze came first, and then next year the great flood, and um, Santa Paula Creek was about a half a mile wide. At Father's place, had wiped out his orange orchard and his vineyard, everything but the house on the line. The next morning we had a bank about eight feet wow. in the river. And so he was wiped out, had a good name though, and he, so he bought 160 acres of brush land and coyotes and owls across the river, put up a little two-room shack, and we children lived there. It eventually was eight of us finally. And I used to be ashamed of it that I had to go barefooted to school summer and winter, and. So I have a good understanding, a good soul yet, but anyway, <laughs> in the eighth grade, Father bought me a pair of shoes so I could get used to them to prepare to go to the Santa Paula High School. But uh, well, you told about you told about catching your first hive, I think. Yes, yeah, was out of the Mupu School up Santa Paula Canyon. And they say one becomes a beekeeper because they have either a sweet tooth or think they're going to get rich. Well, I had both. <laughs> so I had the, almost in the sack when the bell rang. And so I had to go in and I was, well, I couldn't get interested in my lesson. I finally, what should I do? I was afraid they'd fly away. So we had an outdoor privies and I raised my hand. She nodded yet. I didn't say what, but I went up that tree and 
finished tying that sack around the limb and cutting it off. And I thought she didn't know about it. But the next day, she was prepared. She told me to stay after school. For what? But anyway, it was to teach me about And so she started teaching me about bees, buying me books. That was uh, the daughter of the McIntyre that Harry Banks has spoken about. Mm -hmm. Iris became Iris Newby in time. Right about this time, you met a young lady from Camarillo, I believe. Uh, would you like to tell us your uh, courtship yeah. with your wife and so forth? Uh, how can I forget it? <laughs> <laughs> you better not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still married to the same model as I tell them, 50, about 55 years. But some people came by. I had bee yards in the winter because of the uh, frostless area around Oxnard Ventura. And because the eucalyptus blooming in the winter months when nothing for bees to work on, one of the few places in the world where they can work in the winter. So some folks came, friends of ours, and said, oh, George, we saw a beautiful girl down at Camarillo. Uh -oh. Well, I had some bee yards on the other side between Camarillo and Oxnard. So my excuse was to see how my bees were getting along. And I, so and I was introduced to her, and she was, I thought, a rather pretty girl. But anyway, that started our courtship and over a period of time. But on our honeymoon, we were taking a carload of bees uh, up to Bishop. Wait a minute. You had to take a carload of bees to Bishop, <laughs> and you took your wife on the trip as a honeymoon? Yeah, I, I was kind of inexperienced. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. But anyway, uh -huh. they, we had to ice them all the way, so she sat on cakes of ice uh, with a board <laughs> platform and <laughs> broke up cakes of ice and p put them in chunks in the bucket, and then I'd go around and put one on each hive so they'd have some water to drink and also they wouldn't get so warm on the desert. That day it was 117 in the shade out wow. by jawbone grade and they had to transfer them bees to a narrow gauge car. It took three narrow gauge cars to trans hold the one standard car of bees and the Indians were stripped naked to the waist mm -hmm. and they didn't have any protection or anything. The east wind was blowing. That makes bees angry too. Mm. The wife's trying to fix me some breakfast on a little hand uh, coal oil stove and the sand got in the eggs. <laughs> but anyway, these Indians had run and the bees, some of the hives had broken open and they'd sting them. They'd scream like eagles. And I told my wife, I said, they'll never make it. <laughs> but you know, they'd stand there and pretty soon they'd get to laughing and run and scream and, they'd, and they kept up to the transfer that whole car to the mm. narrow gauge. Well, that was Quite a, uh, quite a train. I can see an engine and a coal car and your, your freight car and then the caboose. And you made that trip from Santa Paula to, to Bishop. Yes, well, we had loaded them down to San Fernando yeah. on the railroad Transfer. Track. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That was a fantastic test for a marriage, I'd say. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what a way to... Might have just about <laughs> broke it, too. Yeah, I couldn't get her to go around the bee yard for several years. She got <laughs> stung pretty bad. Yeah. And George, when I was in your office, I noticed you had at least two walls full of ribbons, and you also mentioned that you had a, quite a selection hidden away. And I took a couple of snapshots of those, but of the hundreds, and I think you spoke of, say, 300. Anyway, that's, that's pretty close to the number, 300. Which one of those awards is more meaningful to you than any of the others? Oh, that comes the same year of our honeymoon. We <laughs> they had, used to have a fair out by Riverside called the Southern California Fair. And so uh, there was an inactive bee club here. And so to enter into the big exhibits against the other clubs, you had to be sponsored by a club. So they agreed that I go and put it in for their name. But uh, the thing was that we worked all night on it. It was a big display. And when the fair opened, 10 o'clock next morning, I was trying to finish it up. But uh, we were, as you say, broke, and we didn't have much to eat, but uh, we won $90 in prizes. Uh, and that really <laughs> thrilled us. That was a lot of money. That was big days. money then. That's that right. Money. <laughs> and you're still entering uh, in shows, right, in the fair? Yes, I didn't think I'd be able to last year because of the bad wreck I had, but... Uh, uh, I was able to enter some of the items. I didn't enter any bees because couldn't, I couldn't lift much weight. 
He took away a lot of prizes this year at the fair because I was there and saw them. And soon. handed them out to him. <laughs> yeah. George, there's a, there's a, 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 a long-time argument between bears and man about who that honey belongs to. Have you had any arguments with bees <laughs> or uh, with bears about honeys? Yes, that's what I call a bee hazards. <laughs> the bears, they love honey too, and if they ever get started on a bee yard, they're on a pension. They won't get out and shift anymore. They just uh, eat all they want and then sleep through the day and come back again. But bears are like people. They each have their own personality. For example, some bears will take a comb out like a beekeeper and not to tear up the hive. Others are very explosive and bust up the equipment and the size of the boxes. And um, we've had a lot of experience. They've caused us thousands of dollars damage. I think the worst was on Mount Shasta. We had six yards of 104, 105 to the yard. And uh, some told us there were no bears up there, but the, the trappers, federal trappers said, why are you right in line their migration? Mm. Well, uh, they killed, destroyed over 200 out of the 600 colonies. Oh, wow. And uh, quite a loss. One of the most interesting was uh, in the high Sierra yards we had out of Fresno called Dinky Creek. There was a bear that was very cagey. She had a cub. And I always track them and learn what new things. And she took a box of honey that weighed around 70 pounds and up a crag that I had to use my hands to hold on. It was almost impossible to climb. She carried that in her arms up there because there it is up there on a pine tree and there's the cub tracks that come up from the creek. And she fed that cub up there. They won't allow them in the bee yard because their skin's too tender. The bee stings yeah, hurt you know, there's a picture here, I believe, of your daughter and a bear that you brought in one night. Could, oh, could you tell us the story on that? Yes, uh, she was, uh, we adopted her from Kentucky and uh, said, Maggie, you should go because uh, be a chance to get to see a bear hunt. And she went. Well, we got the car under a tree off from the, the bee yards so that the chrome wouldn't shine, so that would frighten the bears. and. And in the night, sleeping there, uh, she punched me, woke me up, and says, I think I see a bear. Real <laughs> dark night. Well, right beside the car was a great big boulder, but on top of this boulder was another round object. And then on top of that round object was another, which I realized was the head of a bear. And so uh, the bear took off, and my son in the back seat woke up, as I woke him up. But she finally got to see us kill the bear later on. But I always laughed at the fact that we were hunting the bear and the bear was hunting us. <laughs> I think, George Biggers, you're noted mostly for the man with the beard of bees. And if you can get a picture of his, his, uh, well, this is your product, a can of bees, a uh, can of honey, <laughs> five pounds. And it has on there a picture, and it's, you were a pretty young man then, George. <laughs> oh yeah, that was the taking the year I was married too. A lot yeah. of things happened the year I was that, married. That twenty-seven was a big year, wasn't it? Yes, it was <laughs> a big year. <laughs> well, now would you tell us how you managed to get those bees on you to be as a beard? <laughs> well, uh, we had found out experimenting in a bee yard. It was some hives that were mean. So at the lunch hour, the men. Uh, we're off at lunch, and I went out to one of these hives that was crowded and took a, a couple of hands full of bees that were on the side of the hive and uh, put it on my chin and found out in time that when I got a long, quite a long beard that I could do it. But uh, in performances for the TVs and on for the movies, I use a, put two hives together, get enough bees and then uh, that broke open once on Hollywood Boulevard, but that's a story <laughs> in itself. But then uh, on the stage, we uh, begin to shake them into a, a dust basket or something to collect them. And then we begin to pour them and get hands full and hold them, and then that's we get a line formed. 
We stoop over in the, in the dish pan and begin to see it up there. The worst thing is, though, while that's happening, to keep them from covering our face because if one gets mashed or one got tangled once my eyebrows stung me, but if they get mashed, they signal to the others. They're like sheep. They're all, a lot of them get the idea. So that roughly is, it's hard to get them off than to put them on. Now, you yeah. actually had some in your mouth. You put some in your mouth. <laughs> Tell us about that Well, how you get away with it. A TV station, a letter came in wanted something more dramatic than the bee bear and asked me, did I know anything more, dr I mean, more difficult? And I said, yes, uh, putting them in your mouth because uh, they're very sensitive to odors. You don't want to have any B.O. But anyway, <laughs> uh, that's how come that about we put some in, but it almost boomeranged. Uh, in the picture, you can see my eyes begin to bug out the last. and. <laughs> Art Baker says, George, uh, anything wrong? He's whispering to me. And uh, I was to hold him for 30 seconds. And what had happened, one bee had laughed and was, got down to my Adam's apple. And I knew if I squeezed it, it'd sting me. Yeah. And that could excite others. But luckily, the 30 minutes, uh, s seconds rather, came up. So uh, uh, that bee turned and quit being an owlist and come out with the rest of them <laughs> and opened my mouth. Well, now, this is a trick that you have taught your daughter. We have a picture here of your, uh, you're showing your daughter how to handle bees. And she, how old was she in this uh, uh, picture where you had her actually working with a hive of bees? Well, she's, uh, I think about four years old. I know she couldn't talk very plain, still baby talk. And mm -hmm. I think she would, I did that so she wouldn't be afraid of bees, got her yeah. used to them. <laughs> When she, she was very young, as the famous Eagle Rock. Oh, really? Yes, it, the it, bee yard's right behind it. It's the famous Eagle Rock, down at Eagle Rock. Down around Burbank, huh? Well, Glendale, toward yeah. Pasadena. Yeah, yeah. Well, there she is, <laughs> and she and she has her hand right in that hive of bees. Oh, she reach in and stick her finger right through the mass of bees and gouge out honey and look at me and say, mm, good, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Every farmer likes to talk about their big year, George. What was your biggest year in the bee business? Oh, um, a few years ago, they say an idea sometimes uh, is worth a lot of money. And, uh, and I got to analyzing that many of the beekeepers in the Middle West states and the late season in the snow, that they don't use them until about the 1st of June or the uh, first part of July, like Dakota in there about first of July. So I said to one that had a good many thousand colonies to lease me some of your bees early and we'll get them back to you and they'll be much stronger than them setting back here. And that way we was able to put them in almond pollination and get an orange crop and we did quite well until others got on the idea too. And of course, it la we was able to do well before the others got onto it too much. Well, now you said pollination. What what are we talking about here? Pollination of almonds. Bees are very valuable to the farmers for their pollination. And in the almonds, the University of California did three years research and come up that uh, two hives to the acre of bees would increase their almond crop 66% when the almonds are a big crop, big money crop. So. They, we did the pioneer work on almonds and on alfalfa seed, and now we're working on avocados and predict to go through the same routine. At first, they won't get in right pretty soon. They'll find out they're very valuable pollinators. And so the government gave us a AAA priority in time of the war, not the value of honey, but because of the value to 50 lines of agriculture. Yeah. Now, on the way down here, you two, you and Harry, got to talking about the length that bees will travel, the distance that bees will travel to pick up honey or pollen. How far, what, what is the distance? Well, we know for a fact here that bees were, when there were no flowers in the fall, that a bee yard down below Oxnard toward Wainemi was bringing in nectar or honey, but it was really nectar. And so they finally coursed them and they wound up seven miles here on the Santa Clara River. There was a winery, and the bees were working the grape pulp, getting the juice out. So in that, though, the bee dance, 
is very fascinating. They have made a scientific breakthrough on the bee dance, showing that it does a hula hula dance. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> You're going to tell me that bees dance. Now, I want to know a little right. bit, back up a little bit. Why are they in there to dance? I thought they well, were a working bee. They are, but they're telling the scout bees, that just like we find some gold nuggets, go down the street, everybody get around, where'd you find it? Where'd you find it? Well, the scout comes in high and does this hula hula dance. And the bees immediately come around and ring around, and then it's been proven very clearly, and the Japanese made a great breakthrough on that, that uh, the scout bee is telling the other bees the exact number of yards, even over a mile, and then the exact angle in relation to the sun. And they have painted those bees that were told like uh, paint the scout bee and have a dish here and paint it blue. Then they paint the scout bee blue on the thorax. And all the bees that scout bee told them how they painted it blue. Now they put another dish, say up here, this one's close to high, put another one up a half a mile away or a mile away. And they paint it, say, yellow. And do the same thing and only have one hive there. And here these scouts come in, the yellow scouts, the blue scouts, and the green scouts. Each telling a different story, but the bees they told <laughs> never got crossed up. They'd find it once told the blue went to the blue dish and so forth. And then they found out that they had a higher form of mathematics than we have in telling are because the further away the slower the wag. And uh -huh. I have I have documentaries that clearly prove that they don't have to be a scientist. <laughs> That's interesting. We're, we have about a minute and a half, and you were introduced as being a professional beekeeper, but that you had a hobby of helping folks. And could you very briefly tell us about your project in Appalachian Mountains? Well, yes. Um, uh, we were planning to go to the uh, Ozarks to work among people. Because when I was in Old Mexico in the bee business, I saw so many people there that, that were so helpless babies dying and you didn't have to be a doctor to tell them how to save their babies. I'll not go into that detail. But the same thing, and we feel guilty that you know something and uh, people are, are taking it the rough ways. So eventually a gentleman came here and was interested in the little church up at Miner's Oak. And uh, he kept begging me to go back. Well, I was planning to go to the Ozarks and I went th to the Appalachians. Never regretted it. In fact, we went there as an evangelist, uh, not uh, attached to any group. Went there using our bee work, uh, bee income to go where, where there wasn't financial help. And went back and started. And I wondered why the high school kids sometimes get off the bus and all come, boys and girls, and hug me. And I got to thinking why they know they've they got uncles and aunts that have different kind of homes, and they, they appreciate what their home is. George, it's great. we thank you very much for being with us. And Harry, we thank you for being with us. It's been fun. And sometime we're going to get George back here to tell us some more right. yeah. uh, mountain stories, because he's full <laughs> of them. We thank you for watching. Come back.